Hello everyone, I'm Greg Weaver. Welcome to the Audio Analyst. Pardon me. So, the combined abundance of recent conversations and several absurd web posts attempting to convince listeners that LPs are not a high resolution format and that only digital recordings can be considered high resolution convinced me to address this matter and share the real virtues of vinyl playback. Now today I'm going to discuss what it is about the LP format that allows it to enjoy its lofty status as a preferred source in the hyper audio realm. Now, the long playing, or LP, Microgroove 33 and a third RPM phonograph disc, was developed in 1945 by a German-Hungarian engineer, Dr. Peter Karl Goldmark. This new construct was widely adapted and quickly became the standard for incorporating multiple or lengthy recorded works on a single disc. Introduced to the public in the United States by Columbia's future president, Goddard Lieberson, uh, in 1948. It took nearly another decade before Audio Fidelity Research of New York City offered a limited edition stereo record for industry use in 1957. Consumers waited until 1958 for stereo sound recordings to become readily available, setting the standard for generations to come. Now, to this day, Short of the experience possible with some master tape playback, they still represent the finest, most authentic, lifelike, and highest resolution playback format available in our homes, all things considered. A quick review of how the two recording methods differ will give us a good foundation for this discussion. With analog recording, a microphone's diaphragm translates sound pressure variations into electrical energy. That energy is then recorded as a continuously varying output voltage to some medium, such as magnetic tape. To capture audio digitally, the analog signal must be sampled and quantized, with each sample then represented by and stored as a discrete number. Now, this requires the conversion of the continuous analog waveform into a segmented stream of discrete values individually captured, one after another, in specifically timed intervals. Now, by its very definition, a digital recording cannot capture the complete sound wave. It approximates it with a finite series of steps. Now, this process requires that we define two discrete scales, one to determine the period between each individual snapshot of the continuously varying signal, and yet another to represent the amplitude of the signal at each of those discrete points in time. The first scale is known as the sampling rate, and it defines how regularly we examine or sample the analog signal. The second is known as bit depth, and it limits the number of values that may be used to express the amplitude of the signal for each sample which in turn determines how finely, how accurately, we can represent the true amplitude of the signal. For our discussion, let's say that our recording microphone's output voltage range varies from 0 to 1.5 volts. If its output is 1.0483 volts when we choose to take a sample, and we are using a 16-bit word depth, it is more than likely that we will not be able to express the exact voltage at the time of that sample using only the 65,536 distinct values that the 16-bit format allows. Then too, some musical variations that have exceptionally quick transients, such as a drum strike or a trumpet blat, will also see distortion over the time domain because they may change too rapidly to be accurately represented within the chosen sample rate. Now, it should be apparent by these examples that the higher both the sample rate and bit depth we use, the more accurate the digital resolution of the actual analog event will be, offering us the ability to much more closely approximate that exact microphone output voltage at any given time 
and by decreasing the interval between the individual steps of that quantized signal. Now, many of today's most vocal opponents attacking the superiority of LP playback choose to cite age, both the age of the format's proponents, people like myself, Robert Harley, and in fact, the majority of the others in this industry, as well as the format's age, and by extension, its purported technical limitations to support their misconstrued viewpoint. Looking at the first age argument, these LP naysayers argue that because most vinyl adherents are older, such listeners prefer the format because of its familiarity and because they don't comprehend or have chosen not to embrace the obvious advantages digital recording offers. Advantages that they contend make digital the only true high resolution audio format. They clearly expect you to just accept this fallacious ad hominem argument. Now, while those reasons may apply to some vinyl adherents, guess what? I started programming computers in 1971. In 1984, I earned my certificate in digital electronics with honors. I have been certified on both the Microsoft and Apple platforms for decades. I spent 15 years as the senior IT engineer analyst for the athletics department at the University of Notre Dame, have been an IT consultant for AM General in South Bend and Patrick Industries in Elkhart, and I am currently the IS manager at a 140,000 square foot Valio manufacturing site in Elkhart, Indiana. Do you really think I don't understand the nuances and limitations of digital recording? I'll wager that I understand it considerably better than most of these much younger, less qualified voices hopelessly trying to discredit the LP's rightful status as among the most authentically musical formats available. Now, they next point to the format's age and ask you to evaluate the two formats' comparative measurements. Most often, they will cite the differences in their dynamic range capabilities. Now, research will affirm that while the dynamic range possible on a direct cut LP may exceed 70 decibels, 65 decibels has been accepted as the typical dynamic range capability for LPs. Crunching the numbers on the 16-bit 44.1 kilohertz format show that it can accomplish 96 decibels of absolute dynamic range. DirectStream Digital offers around 120 decibels in the audible frequency range, and 24-bit 192 kilohertz recordings have a theoretical maximum of around 144 decibels of dynamic range. Now, the LP naysayers erroneously ask you to focus on the LP format's 65 decibel dynamic range limitation. But, when you understand how recordings are made and mastered, those theoretical limits become... moot. There are clearly true but not relevant issues at play here upon which the digital audio proponents attempt to support their contentions. Now, musically speaking, we needn't be concerned with any format's absolute dynamic range capability, its range from dead silent to the loudest passage it can possibly reproduce. Why? Because sadly, most music being released today has a dynamic range limit of about 10 decibels or less. Mastering for today's typical over-the-air broadcast mediums like AM, FM, and Sirius Radio, and the no or very low-cost streaming mediums like those from Amazon, Apple, Deezer, Pandora, Spotify, etc., pumps up the global volume of each track. Now, this is accomplished by limiting and compressing the dynamic range across the entire running length of the song. This not only has the effect of making the overall track louder, but it also tends to diminish our natural attraction to and excitement about hearing such recordings. Taking this a logical step further, most acknowledged mastering gurus, legends like Bernie Grunman, Steve Hoffman, Bob Katz, Robert Ludwig, even the late Stan Ricker, recommended using something on the order of about 20 decibels, perhaps a tad more, maybe to 30 decibels with full-scale orchestral works, 
to deliver an engaging and powerful recording. Understanding this tends to negate any concerns over even the 65 decibel limit of the LP. This true but not relevant understanding really abrogates the premise of assuming any format is superior to another based solely on its dynamic range capability. Now, much of the seemingly rather rampant misunderstanding about the remarkably exquisite soundscapes recreated by the stereo LP record come down to matters that can be easily addressed by examining the essential relativity, exposure, and epistemic concerns. What do I mean by relativity? Clearly, when listening to comparable products in the very affordable price ranges, say under $500 uh, spent on an entire turntable system or on a CD player or a DAC, virtually everyone will prefer digital. But once you hit a certain level of performance, one that is typically much costlier than all but a very small percentage of music lovers are willing to expend, there is just no contest. Now, where is that level? That can be extremely fluid and hard to define. And sadly, I know too many digital audio proponents out there who have no real experience with carefully set up true Hyper LP playback systems. When dealing with exposure to reference quality LP playback, I'm sorry to say that listeners familiar with 5,000, 10,000, or even 25,000 full analog chain systems, uh, that would include a turntable, its power supply, a tone arm, cartridge, its interconnects and phono preamplifier. While such clearly competent systems may be routinely highly musical and engaging, we are still not in the realm of systems that consistently outperform even the most expensive digital systems available at this time. Now, at the upper limits, with an utterly top flight, properly set up LP playback system, such as I witnessed during the recent launch of the Kronos Discovery, with the right records, the first half of that epistemic issue I've mentioned, and with careful, knowledgeable setup, the second half of that same issue, they may routinely outperform not only master tape playback, but the finest, most exotic digital playback chains I've heard, including four, three, two, or even one box flagship systems from among the most revered names in digital to analog conversion, some eclipsing $200,000. But you see, sadly, not all LPs are created equally. As an example, Discogs, the largest online music database, shows over 380 releases of the Dave Brubeck Quartet's 1959 classic, Time Out. Now, while my original 1959 Columbia 6i sounds fabulous, I recently got to hear the 2002 Classic Records reissue head-to-head against my 2012 Analog Productions 245 RPM reissue. The classic was the clear winner. As good as I've always found the 2012 Analog Productions release, even when compared to the original, I ponied up the dough to get a mint minus copy of the classic reissue. To realize the absolute best from the format, one must learn about and cultivate a reasonable knowledge and understanding of the recordings one will use including the nuances of different pressings and reissues. Such mastery takes time and may actually play a large scale in the attraction to some users to this format. Now, just what do I mean when I say that vinyl outperforms digital? Excellent LP playback systems offer several sonic attributes, which are either missing or noticeably underdeveloped with the digital formats and as such sound considerably more authentic coming much closer to approximating the illusion of a live performance in a real space. They may offer a fuller and warmer expression of timbre, a more corporal, richer, more vivid sense of texture, and they regenerate a sense of dimensionality, of space, of openness, 
unlike anything yet available from even the finest digital playback available today. The very best LP playback offers a conspicuously more three-dimensional sonic envelope, offering images with subtler, finer detail, tone colors that are rendered more vibrantly, full of nuanced detail that is more vital. Timbre may be more natural and honest sounding. Bass, especially deep bass pitch definition, is fuller, rounder, and richer. Voices are more present, providing a more articulate and honest interpretation of the body that created them, facilitating a more natural development of their own bloom. Symbols are recreated with greater detail, offer a more bronzy flavor, and are more lifelike sounding. They are more likely to shimmer over you rather than to splash at you. The soundstage is more dimensional in its layering, rendering a more faithful construct of discrete location in both the space of and around individual instruments. Now, these attributes all combine, generating more genuine vitality and imbuing the music with a sense of verve that is inescapable and readily apparent to anyone that chooses to listen. In a recent social media posting about the sonic accomplishments of the Kronos Discovery, a previous stereo file writer opined, so much money for such a flawed format. I didn't respond. Loudspeaker manufacturer Dan von Schweikert responded with, if you say so, anecdotally speaking, surely, this format has exceeded all digital sources I've experienced to date. That said, I'm fortunate to own some truly exceptional digital sources that bring welcome convenience to my system. But when I want to show off, dot, dot, dot. The clear implication with the ellipsis is that he plays LPs to really flaunt his product's inherent musical capabilities. I'll freely admit that I have grown much more format agnostic over time and can acknowledge that digital formats have made incredible advances since their half-baked arrival on the scene with the compact disc back in the early 1980s. Honestly, I don't doubt that at some point, digital recording may be able to at least compare to, if not overtake, the sonic authenticity of analog recording. But that time has yet to come for this listener. Further, though I've barely scratched the surface of the topic here today, I am not suggesting that anyone should abandon digital music playback and listen only to LPs. But all you angry and confused digifiles, it's time to give up your unsupportable, less than earnest, far from relevant attack on the most engaging and authentic sounding source available today in the hyper audio segment of the market. LPs are clearly as high resolution as it gets. If you don't like them, don't listen. Just get over it, quit trying to dismiss or deny the advantages of LP playback, and enjoy your music on whatever format you prefer. Now, in closing, I'll ask you to ponder the words of grizzled rock veteran Neil Young, who once said that if you equate listening to vinyl to the feel of water falling on you when you are standing under a waterfall, listening to digital is like standing under someone pouring buckets of ice over you. While a bit stark, it makes an unmistakable and graphic point. If you are enjoying the content and information presented here and would like to see more content like it, please click that subscribe button and don't forget to like and share links to your favorite episodes with your friends or on social media. I love hearing from you, so be sure to post comments and questions. And information on supporting the channel may be found in today's description section or at my website, theaudioanalyst.com. Thanks again for taking the time to drop by and visit today. Please stay safe and keep the music playing. Till next time, cheers. <laughs>